Hello, hello, I will be your librarian today. So Smogist is this month where you draw a dragon for every day for the month of August. And I completely forgot. But luckily the drawing that the video that's in the next video after this does have a bunch of alien creatures that look somewhat like dragons. But before I did that one, I had to draw the people who are going on the expedition to the other planet. Now these people are from the organization that the librarian, which is on screen right now, that she's a part of. And this is like a little bit earlier in the timeline than the Cat's Library story that you, you've already seen. You have already seen it, right? Go watch it if you haven't. And so yeah, this is just a lineup of five characters and the lore about what they're like. The last time on the Cat's Library, the librarian came across the private library of one Felix Catton and found nothing. And now for something completely different. The expedition of the planet A2. Now the organization that the librarian was a part of had contact with the people of planet A2 for over 200 years. It took about 50 years for the two planets to make up a Morse code type system that made sense. And after that, they talked about whatever nonsense was going on on their respective planets. Earth had a few major wars going on and several of the world's countries independently discovered the broadcast and decided to keep the discovery of aliens secret from the nations of the world and general populace. The Codebreakers also picked up each other's signals and became friends because they didn't know where the broadcasts were coming from. After they discovered the truth about each other and the aliens clarified that they weren't willing or able to participate in any wars, the Codebreakers fled their respective countries with notes explaining that the whole thing had been a scam and met up in a secure location to make an institution to continue the conversations with the aliens. 200 years later, and the aliens sent out a distress call. The alien group involved in contact called themselves the Star Searchers, though they weren't as secretive on their planet as the Earthlings were on theirs. The aliens sent through the mathematics for teleportation technology, and the bosses of, at the Codebreaker set to work assembling a five-person team, which is the maximum amount of personage that could go through the, with the electrical power limitations. They promised the aliens that they could send more help through, and this was only the scout team to evaluate the situation. The first person selected was Ari Zlatnin. He had this way about him, where you noticed when he came in a room. He was confident and friendly enough, but also willing to be honest with what people could improve in a way that made them strive to improve. He would really listen to people, was as tall and handsome as a certain artist could draw, and he had absolutely no talent for leadership. He had just joined the Codebreakers for the science. Sadly, his parents had died when he was 15 and 17, respectively. He was mostly raised by his uncle in the neighboring province after that. Despite this, he still managed to put himself through college with the inheritance funds. For his bachelor's thesis in botany, with a minor in biology, he had somehow found a moondrop flower. He went on to explain that outer space was an aether, not a vacuum, and it contained a myriad of wildlife which floated in the breathable fabric of the void. He backed up his claim by showing video footage of various experiments that he had done with the plant and conducted one experiment in class. He demonstrated a series of equations on the blackboard and turned to the speechless class for questions. A few people snickered into their hands. The professor took Ari out into the hall and they had a conversation that started out cordial enough but eventually grew into a heated debate about what qualified as true science. It eventually devolved into Ari getting halfway into a deeply personal insult before choking on his words, giving a hasty apology, and practically running out into the school parking lot without going back for his plant or backpack. 
He was considering having a good crying session about then when a woman in sunglasses and heels came up to greet him. For reference, this was the middle of winter. She said that she had heard his speech and she believed him and gave him a card for the local codebreakers headquarters. And that was how he joined the institution and later the first scout party. Since he went to space, his new wife also came along. His wife was named Dahlia. Dahlia was working as a waitress in a somewhat classy bar in the same city as Ari and the codebreakers headquarters. One day's night, while she was working like a dog, a glassman broke into the back room. In this case, the glassman was a glass woman who had recently escaped a codebreaker holding facility on the stated grounds of starting a cult involving her supernatural powers. Glassman was just the species name, just like how it is a human, not a he woman. There was a little more to her arrest than that, but that's the gist. Dahlia found her rooting around looking for a stove or some sort of fire to melt a fracture on her hand back together. Dahlia knew what the creature was looking for because of the, ref the reflections of a glassman, showcased images of their thoughts. This was usually used for communication purposes, but made keeping secrets from sighted humans to be especially perilous. At first, Dahlia couldn't see her own reflection in the being's skin, even though the light and angle were correct. As the glassman became aware of her presence, her reflection suddenly flickered onto the sculpted muscles of the creature's back. The two stared at each other, and the human woman watched as scenes from her own life flashed through the crystal ball of the glassman's head. Eventually, the images came up to the present moment and then a bit beyond it. Both of them saw that the bar was surrounded by codebreaker agents who were planning on filling the building with sleeping gas and rearresting their prisoner. The glassman psychically searched for a means of escape, all of which resulted in her getting shattered or arrested. Dahlia didn't understand what was going on, but she ran into the room with where her co-workers were setting things up before opening. She awkwardly tried to tell them what was going on, but they thought it was a prank. She saw the smoke start to come in from under the door and leapt up onto a table, pulling her scarf around her mouth. Everyone fell asleep. Dahlia was slightly drowsy, but managed to stay awake. The codebreaker offices came in completely covered up and wearing gas masks so that Dahlia was left wondering whether they were also glass people. But they were all just regular humans. One of them approached her, pulled down her scarf, and put a hose full of gas into her face before she could even consider running away. She held her breath, but pretended to fall asleep, then she followed the agents to the codebreaker's headquarters and hung around until they gave her a job. She was the gopher and got to meet pretty much everyone in the facility by bringing everyone coffee. Really nice imported coffee from a fancy machine. Codebreaker agents had to renounce their citizenship to their respective countries and pledge loyalty to the codebreakers, which basically functioned as an independent republic with no land. Dahlia was wondering about whether she made the right decision as she walked into the greenhouse with someone's coffee. She noticed a flower that was kind of like a lily of the valley, except the leaves were white and the buds were much larger than in a normal specimen. She became enraptured. Ori came up behind her and coughed quietly to get her attention. Dahlia jumped, but she didn't drop the coffee. They had a lengthy conversation about aether biology, which only ended because Dahlia's supervisor came to find out where she was. Ari still asked her out on the spot. Dahlia was also charged with providing the prisoners in the holding cells with food, water, and any other necessary supplies. The coldest glassman was also there, and somehow had a myriad of necessary items, like more glass cleaning than anyone knew existed, and she wanted her clothes cleaned along with everyone else, even though she didn't have skin or sweat to get them dirty. Glassmen are mute and technically blind, deaf, and incapable of taste, touch, and smell. They experience the world by constantly questioning what is around them and using their power to know the answer to those questions to navigate daily lives. This makes communication with humans very complicated. Dahlia communicated with her through handwritten notes, and the two strangely made fast friends. The glassman gave a list of potential names and said that they had all been what other people had called her over her life, 
These names included Katrina, Anastasia, and Alejandra, though the most recent name was Saffron. The two women just sort of clicked, even though they were very different people. At the same time, Saffron had a boyfriend, Mike, who somehow managed to board a plane with a baseball bat and break into HQ within a month of the Glassman's arrest. He was unsuccessful in his attempt to break Saffron out and was temporarily arrested himself. Management quickly put together that he had a specialized skill set, being able to find Saffron so fast, and gave him a few low-paying prison jobs to test out his field potential. The other convicts in the holding cells were shipped to a proper correctional facility, while Mike and Saffron were allowed to say, stay. Saffron, because even a liar capable of knowing everything, was better than a truth teller who knew nothing at all, according to the codebreakers, anyway. Mike got to stay because he had a knack for epsionage, ep, the ability to speak three languages, including Glassman Sign Language, and could adapt to be a follower, leader, or an independent on any given mission. On the more social side of things, Dahlia helped Mike untangle all of the lies that his girlfriend had put him through, some of which Saffron volunteered a confession and apology for unprompted. The two broke up, but decided to stay friends. Not close friends, but friends regardless. While the relationship grew more and more complicated, Dahlia and Ari grew closer. By the end of the spring, the two eloped, though the code through the codebreaker chapel. Mike was a bit m more over-enthusiastic than was in character, and he brought them a king-size bed for a wedding present. He playfully lorded this over Saffron, who gave them a store-bought card that she hadn't signed and could clearly be seen pirating a horse documentary across her glassy skin and watching that through the duration of the ceremony. She said she didn't care, and it was impossible of being able to tell what she was feeling about that the statement as she didn't have a face. The four of them went on one practice mission after the marriage, which had mixed results. The head of their branch put Ari in charge since he had seniority and didn't have a criminal record. However, as previously stated, Ari had absolutely no skill for leadership. They got halfway through the mission before he conceded to put Mike in charge, which was the only thing that saved the mission from being a total disaster. It was several months before they were selected to go on their second mission, which was at the, as the scout team through the portal to planet A2. This time, the president of the organization herself provided the team with a senior field agent to be the leader. Alani was a half-human, and she did not provide any information on what the other half could be or anything at all about her parents or past. However, she had proven her loyalty to the codebreakers many times over the, her years of service. That was all the head of the branch told them. Going through the compound, stories about Alani circulated until no one knew what was true and what was false, and no one cared as long as the stories were good. Some of the more popular stories included The previous president had discovered her living in his garage, and he had cleaned her up for political reasons, even though she had been raised by wolves and had never really acclimated to civilized life. Alani was an assassin for the cause and had killed more people than anyone else the group combined. Among them, the number was one, but she still had a sizable list. She was the sole survivor of the lost city of Atlantis. She was a long living modified human who had been the codebreaker's first contact, and the whole organization was founded on a sick joke that had gone on too long. No one really knew what was up. When Alani actually arrived, she couldn't meet the expectations everyone had in their minds. She seemed nice and not at all savage, though she made a joke about eating humans that no one seemed to get, so she just kept hammering away at it until everyone was incredibly uncomfortable about whether or not she would actually eat people, and Alani went to bed early in shame. After that, she stayed more or less stoically distant from the group, though she did not did make a few strange jokes every now and then, and still acted friendly. She wasn't great at being stoically distant in a way that other people could understand, she was just reserved emotionally. They all went on like that for a week, before management couldn't wait any longer and they entered into the portal. But that is the story for another time.
So first up on the list, we have Ari. Now, all I knew about Ari was that I wanted to him to have a blue Argyle sweater vest, red hair, and hold holding a prop of something to do with his science. So I gave him a beaker full of a green viscous liquid. He is one of the characters who, from the sketch that I did, the color sketch, to the final rendition, changed the least. I also gave him Oxford shoes, as you can see. I tried to give everyone a different type of shoe and a different type of outfit. His is very academic inspired. And that is the blush that I'm putting on him. I had trouble with skin tone on a few of these characters. Now, around here, you're probably gonna see it, but Photoshop crashed and I had to start over basically from the beginning. So let's see, yep, there we go. So I have to start all over again. Like mostly the skin and the hair was right. I changed the hair about here because it seemed a little bit too cartoony, but then I changed it to be basically the same as what it was before. Like I did the glow up shots of these characters. And the first thing mom said when she saw all of these characters together was that Ari's one eye is a little bit wonky. Now I'm not sure about the hand here. I think it was correct before and I might have made it incorrect right there. I don't know. I prob This is probably why you need to use a reference. Now the Argyle spots on the sweater are misaligned there. I fixed them. Eventually I gave him a belt buckle because reasons. It's a little bit shiny and a little bit more bubbly than I would have liked, but there you go. So brown shoes, brown pants because he has an orange and blue color scheme. I gave them all colored line art. That's a different color. I shaded in a bright purple, but I put it on a multiply layer so it melds into the colors of the background. So this isn't like the final shadow, shadow layer. It looks a little bit better when I get to it. You see right there. And then I put a highlight layer. I just put a basic shadow and highlight layer on him. And Bob's your uncle, there you go. Next up, we have Dahlia. Now, Dahlia, I wanted her to have more of a rounded shape language because she's supposed to be more of a friendly character. Like, I sort of just like triangles. It's like one of my favorite shapes. So I had a little bit of triangles in her design She's so that she matches Ari, who is her husband. But mostly, you see, she has a rounded head shape and then she has that bun of hair. She has a lot of hair, by the way. But that bun of hair really big bun, is all round. She has sort of a rounded shirt. Like if you look at look at it, it's like a lot of more rounded stuff. Like if you see where Ari right there, then I had a lot of triangles and squares and like sharp edges with him. And with Dolly, I made her more curved and rounded. Like these characters are supposed to be a little bit on the older side. Like I didn't say it in the story because I want it to be like more of a nebulous time frame. But they're supposed to be like late 60s, early 70s. So that's what it is. Future Bethany. I meant that the story takes place in the 1960s and early 1970s, not that the characters are that specific age. Okay, now with, on with the story. And I gave her heels. Now heels are my mortal enemy and Sort of was thinking for a minute that like heels should be like the villain thing, but uh, you know, probably shouldn't just have like a whole fashion accessory to be denoted with evil, even if I am terrified. Like, I don't know why I gave her that necklace. Like it just seemed to fit her nose. Like I fix her nose later, which is good. Trying to get it to the right height so that she's on the same plane as Ari right there. Let's see, what else can I say about her? Yeah. I wasn't sure whether to give her black hair or dark brown hair, so I think I ended up giving her dark brown. Now, she's supposed to be Jewish, so she has sort of more of an olive skin tone. And for some reason, I had a lot of trouble with her skin tone specifically. Like, I said that I had trouble with a few of these people's skin tone, but I was talking about her. And for some reason, I also gave her brown pants because she's more grounded and it matches her hair. And she sort of does match Ari because Ari's secondary color is also 
like, I, I guess it's not his secondary color, but his pants color and, like, on his shoes and stuff is brown. And it's, like, a different shade of brown. But it, it's sort of interesting. Like, his hair matches his pants, and then her hair matches her pants. And I did the same, I tried to get the same shade of bright purple to shade her as well. And, let's see, yeah, I think I was... Check. I was double checking Ari to see what the correct shade was for the uh, shadow layer and the highlight layer so that I could get them to look uniform. And I wasn't sure whether to give her brown line art or green line art. Trying to get one so that her hair popped out. So what we have here is the character who I couldn't decide on a name for in time for the video to come out, but I start, called her Saffron. And then just recently, like last night, I realized that there was, I, I learned this new name, which was Mary Angela. And I'm like, that that would be perfect for her. So may, maybe I'll call her Mary Angela, but I, I said that she had a lot of names because I, well, it sort of fit her character. And also I couldn't decide. <laughs> But yeah, for some reason, my pen, when I was drawing her, didn't have any pressure sensitivity. So I'm drawing this all where the pen was the same pressure every time. And it was really like throwing me off a little bit. It might have been why I forgot to do line art for her until like after the screen recording was over. So what we have here is me trying to draw glass. And I really love to draw glass. Like I realized a while back, like I, I created this character like a little while back that was made of glass like this and looked very similar. And I really liked him. So I decided to like make him more on theme and like more fortune teller vibes. For some reason I gave her the dress that Mirabelle has in Encanto. And I don't really know why I did that and why I associate that with fortune tellers, but I did. Yeah, this, this is the frame because like, glassmen have floating glass, and that, that is how their anatomy is formed. And so they, they get tired sometimes, so they have these framework to hold their glass together in. Yeah, I'm still working out the designs. I could do a whole video on the anatomy of glassmen, like, particularly, and I might do one, one of those. I'm not sure if I'm going to have them be, like, more nebulous and we learn bits and pieces through the, through the story, or whether I'll have like a video that explains it. Now, one of the questions that I know someone is going to ask is like, why is this a girl? And like the short of it is that the girls have fire powers, like eventually, like one day, every 10 years, they have the power of fire. They bring the fire to the like procreation process. And then the men have the telekinesis where their glass, like the glass can float. So with the men, they float all of the limestone and the sand and stuff that's required to make the glass, and they have their telekinesis so that it just flocks to them. And the women fire it up. And that that is how baby glassmen are born. Sometimes. Like, other times, it's just that there's, like, random sheets of glass that just show up out of nowhere, and then you just, like, eventually you just realize, oh, why is this sheet of glass that showed up at my house. Why is this like this? Yep. What is that? Okay. So now we have Mike. Mike was originally supposed to be Frank, like that when I decided who I wanted, like the type of character for the team dynamic, I was just thinking Frank as a stock title because he was supposed to be super honest. And because, you know, I have trouble with names sometimes. You know, every, everyone has trouble with, like, naming their characters. And that, that was a little bit too on the nose. And so I just, I don't know. For some reason, while I was writing the script, I forgot that I wanted to call him Frank. And I just changed it to Mike. Because I sort of forgot I wanted to call him Frank. And, like, he's Mike now. Like, I can't change it. And so, yeah. Like, his fashion... Like, I might change it at some point. Like, I like this type of fashion on him, like, specifically. But I'm not sure 
if all of the things that I put into this character make it make sense for him. <laughs> like, he's supposed to be this guy who looks really tough and, like, he has a bit of a temper and stuff, but he, he actually doesn't. It's like a little bit of a... Uh, yeah, here I'm trying to get the proportions right. So I drew Ari and I drew Dahlia right next to each other. And then I drew, like, what's her face? Saffron. I drew Saffron. And Saffron has different proportions to a normal human. So with here, I'm trying to get him so that he looks like he's in the same style as Ari there. And he's a little bit taller. Okay, yeah. Here we go. And for some reason, like when I was drawing the the rough sketch, I had it so that he had that interesting thing with the dreadlocks sticking out like that. But then when I looked up like reference pictures of what people with dreadlocks actually look like, the dreadlocks usually hang down. So I changed it and it sort of completely changed the silhouette of his face so that he looks more rounded. Like he has a little bit of the spikes with the outfit, has a lot of spikes, a lot of jagged edges, a lot of asymmetry going on there. But his shoes are rounded and his hair is rounded so that that's one of the other reasons why i want to change his outfit other than it doesn't really like fit who he is as a character like i guess he might want to look tough and stuff but if this is supposed to be like circa the 1960s and stuff then this is gonna look this doesn't look like edgy and like hipstery it looks like he's poor which, like, you know, it's the difference in the generational gap. Because, like, right now, this would be really, like, cool and trendy. But, like, back then, it, it wouldn't be. And really worried about that baseball bat. <laughs> For some reason, I don't know why I gave him a baseball bat. It just, like, I was watching uh, playthroughs of someone who was playing a video game where the video game had a baseball bat. Hmm. Yeah, I've lost a lot of the recordings because, like, I, I have some of it, but it's, it's, it's all mixed up now. But you, you'll see it all at the end. You'll see all of the characters at the end. Yep, there, there we go. Well, actually, that wasn't him. So this is what? What? What did I name her? What did I name you? I'm just blanking on this now. Hmm. What is your name? Your name is Alani. That's what it is. And it was a Hawaiian name, but I changed the spelling because the way that the Hawaiian name Alani is spelled is A-O-L-A-N-I. And I am never going to remember that the O is supposed to be silent and she's an alien. So I changed the spelling. So it is a completely original name and has uh, no bearings on what the actual thing is. Now, for some reason, I changed her the most from the original sketch to the concept art because I just felt like I wanted to do like sort of an ancient Greek, ancient Egyptian style drawing. I just felt like I wanted to do it because it suited the character, I guess. So that's what I did. I give her hair. She sort of looks good bald, though. Like... I don't know. It's like she she has the face. She has the face for it. And I drew the hair in here orange because orange and blue are complementary colors like that. But um, I don't stick with that. I have this other character who's sort of like has a similar premise, who has a hairstyle very similar to this, who is a blonde. And like I already have Ari, who's blonde. And I was going to have her have in a turtleneck, but then I decided that that wouldn't fit the, the pose that I have there. So there we go. And I had trouble putting your hands on her hips. Like, I don't think I usually have that much of a problem putting hands on hips. That's why you draw the hips first and then the hands. And then you put the arm to the shoulder. That's that's the order of operations where you're supposed to do it. And it changed the angle of the hair there. She has like nice crescent shapes. Like a lot of flowy fabric, a lot of flowing hair. She has like the bangles. And so I gave her blue skin and the white hair, which looked a lot like the character that she was originally supposed to be based off. 
And then I did white to yellow so that it's like two of the people that this sort of looks like. I wasn't sure what color those should be. I made them sort of brown so it looks like she has like a leather strap around her wrists and stuff. This is sort of my favorite right here with the hair. Like the, it goes like, you, you, you passed it, but it was having the red in it and it looked like a comet. And my other character that this is based off, I'm probably going to change that and have her have like a little bit of red in her hair because I look good. But I, I like this scion. It, it sort of, she doesn't really have the same color scheme as everyone else. If you see there, like everyone else has sort of a similar color scheme and then she's a little bit off. And I, I think that that fits her character. So there we go. That, that is all of my characters that are going to go off across the lands, across into space. And then once there, you'll never know what sort of alien creatures that they will come up against and why the aliens have called them there in the first place. Do you know? Because I don't know.